Well, welcome to the first topic, topic four um, in, within the second module, uh, Natural Channels. And in topic four, we're going to deal with the characteristics and behavior of sediments. This will be in three parts. In the first part, we'll deal with sediment size and classification and talk about how to measure sediment size, taking sediment samples, and then reporting on the size of sediments. Well, why is sediment size or particle size important? Well, we know from module one, it affects channel roughness and hence the, the, the resistance, the flow resistance of river channels. We'll learn later in this module um, that it affects channel stability and, and erosion and scour. It's a factor in influencing sediment transport loads. It also determines the permeability and porosity of boundary sediments, which influences the exchange of water between river channels and the groundwater. And that's important for a range of um, biogeochemical processes. Fine sediments are particularly important for um, the transport of contaminants that become attached to those fine sediments. So sediment size is important for contaminant dynamics in streams. And it's also important for aquatic habitats. A sandy bed stream is a very different um, habitat from a, a bedrock or bedrock or boulder stream. So first, let's talk about sampling sediments and measuring their size. And there's three primary approaches. There's a volume sampling approach, which uses sieving. There's grid sampling, um, which generally uses direct particle size measurements. And then there's area sampling. With volume sampling, we take a, a sample, a bulk sample, usually of a known volume. It could be dug out of the stream using a shovel, placed in a bag. Um, we sieve that with uh, a standard set of sieves, um, which have a mesh of decreasing size as you move down through the stack of sieves. Um, then we weigh the mass of sediment that's trapped in each sieve. It's possible to use a sort of a dry sieving method or a wet sieving method. Uh, where water is ad added with the dry sieving method, uh, a mechanical shaker is often used. And there's relative merits of the two approaches, which you can read about um, in the texts. This approach works well when we have you know, a relatively small sized stream particles of um, small pebbles and, and sands uh, and so on, where we have um, a bed which has a much coarser material, or cobbles and boulders and, and pebbles and so on, then um, sieving becomes impractical and unnecessary. An alternative approach is to use a grid sampling method with a direct particle size measurement. And in this approach we um, overlay a grid, it could be generated using tapes laid across cross sections or wires or some sort of frame with grids on it. In fact this is just a way of getting a, a random sample and some people use a sort of a random walk approach where you take a step in, in different directions um, and you, um, you, you, where you step becomes the, the points on the grid that you sample. And under each grid um, you take a, an individual rock, the rock directly under, the, under that grid and if you're doing a random step approach what generally happens is you take the rock that's directly under your, your big toe um, as your sample and it's important when you're taking that rock, you actually um, look away. So you're not biasing that sample by looking at it. You're taking um, a sort of a random particle underneath that grid point. The size of that is measured. Um, and one way to measure it is using uh, a gravelometer, which is a fancy name for just a, um, uh, a piece of um, metal with a bunch of holes in it of different size. And you use that to measure uh, the smallest uh, size uh, hole in the gravelometer um, through which you can pass the, uh, the rock. Uh, it's a bit like a sieve, if you like. The other approach is to actually measure uh, the three axes, the A, B and C axes. The A axis is the longest um, axis uh, for, the, for the irregular sized rock. The C axis is the shortest axis, orthogonal to the um, A axis. And the B axis is the intermediate axis. That's the longest axis orthogonal to the A axis. And it's often the B axis that we use to characterize the size of individual particles because that's 
um, related to the size of the hole through which it would pass if you were sieving um, the rock. The third approach is, is area sampling and uh, a common way of doing this is using a camera, taking a, a photograph of a fixed area, perhaps with a grid or a scale laid out with which to, to measure um, the particle sizes um, visible in that particular area from the, from the photograph. So that's useful if we're particularly interested in just getting a surface layer um, getting, to characterize the sediment sizes at the, at the, at the surface layer. So that's how um, sediment size is measured, but how do we decide exactly where we take these samples? What's the, what's, which, which bar, which, which point in the river do we, do we measure, do, do we sample from? And that might be quite straightforward. In, these, in the case of these two rivers, we have um, the lower right, it's a fairly uniform sandy bar, and the on the upper left we have a gravel bar, which is also fairly uniform. So wherever we take the sample, we're likely to get a similar result. But in reality, in many streams, the particle sizes on the stream bed vary considerably um, within, the, within the channel. In fact, on this upper left one where we can see the, um, the, the gravel bar and the, and the bed particles on the bar, whilst it looks like a fairly uniform um, or a, 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 um, a uniform distribution of, of sediment sizes, um, spatial, which doesn't vary spatially. In fact, if we look closer, there is some variation. We can see some finer sediments um, in this region here. And if we dug away at the bar, we may well find that the sediments get finer um, uh, underneath the surface layer. Um, and that's demonstrated here uh, in this photograph where a small bit of the surface layer has been scraped away and we can see the, the second layer, the sub-layer sub underneath that, um, that surface layer. And the reason why we get um, this sort of decrease in sediment size or greater proportion of finer sediments um, underneath the surface layer is because the surface layer can form what's called an armoring layer. Um, what's happened is that during the higher flow when sediment has been mobilized, the finer sediment has been washed away, the coarser sediments have been retained, the coarser sediments at the surface has been retained, and they've formed an armor layer that's protected the finer sediments um, lower, lower in the bed. And so uh, we can get um, variation in sediment size at the surface, the subsurface, and potentially even a third layer, deep, a deeper layer at the bottom layer or base. We can also get variations in sediment size across a bar, and here we can see a river where the, the flow goes from, uh, from this, this direction uh, around the channel, and we generally get um, a coarser sediment, larger sediment sizes on the upstream side of this of, of point bars. This point bar is on the inside of meander bends, and we get a um, uh, finer sediments, uh, like we see here, on the inside or the downstream edge of the point bar. And that's because um, erosion of sediments occurs on this upstream edge, and they get deposited on this downstream edge when the point bar is overtopped during a higher flow event. And we can see a similar thing here with these sort of finer sediment deposits on the lower edge of this point bar. And sediment size also varies from um, across the channel. So this is quite close to the, uh, the water's edge we can see here, so in the center of the channel where we have fairly coarse, large um, sediment sizes, but only a small amount of this sort of fine material or finer material sands in amongst these cobbles. Um, but if we go to the edge of the channel, we can see much more finer material towards the edge. And around obstructionist to flow, like this um, vegetation in the middle of this channel, we also get um, some variation. We get uh, de deposits of sediment um, on the, um, uh, um, in this case, um, uh, both upstream and downstream of the, um, this, this patch of vegetation. We also we no doubt get some scour around that vegetation, some erosion uh, of sediments around that, around that vegetation as well. And there'll be variation in sediment sizes, generally finer um, in these depositional features um, around uh, that flow obstruction. And again here we can see um, uh, these fine sediments being deposited 
downstream of this vegetation flows sort of from the back to the forwards in this photo. Um, and uh, this is a depositional feature uh, which has finer sediments that have been transported and deposited um, to this point. Um, deeper in this, um, in this rip ripple here, this riffle, we would find to be much more coarser material because it's more erosional in character, um, that part of the channel. So when we're sampling um, uh, bed sediments, we need to be conscious that they do vary uh, across the cross-section of a channel, longitudinally along a channel, um, and over the individual um, bed forms like bars, point bars in this island in, in the middle of the channel here, and with depth um, uh, within um, uh, a location um, on, on, in the stream channel. And there is actually no correct way to sample um, the stream bed sediments. It depends on the question you're asking. If you're interested in the roughness of the channel, then you might want to just sample the surface layer. If you're interested in what's being transported in, you know, during uh, higher flow events, you might want to sample um, areas where there's deposition, like here, and that will tell you what's being transported um, during, uh, during flow events. If you're interested in the permeability of the bed sediments, then you might sample um, uh, deeper within within the bed sediments to get a picture of the um, the permeability, um, the, so the mean permeability of the bed sediments um, below the river channel. The important thing is that you choose a method of uh, sampling bed sediments that re that is um, um, reflects the particular aspects of the, the, the spatial variability in bed sediments that's of interest um, in your particular study. Once we've sampled the sediments and we've got some uh, information about their size, we then might want to communicate that size to other people. And one way to communicate that is using this Wentworth scale, where particular size classes are assigned to a type or a, a, a given a description of, of that size. And so we have boulders, cobble, gravel, sand, silt and clay. Um, it's probably just useful to remember the range for sand, um, which goes from you know, somewhere around 0.05 uh, millimetres up to 2 millimetres. That's the size range for sands. And just below sands we get silts, and above sands we get gravels. Um, and that these... Um, Sizes, which is a linear, linear scale in millimetres, can also be converted to a phi scale. Um, we see that here. That's where you um, use the log base 2 to convert size in millimetres to these numbers here, which give a, perhaps a, an easier way of representing size, although for me personally I prefer to see the, uh, the dimensions in millimetres. The other way to present information on size um, in your sample, of, because of course there's many different size particles in a typical sample from a stream, is to present them as a cumulative um, distribution function. And here we can see the percent of um, particles uh, by weight that are finer than a given grain size. So this is the result of a sieve analysis where we've shaken sieves of different size, we've weighed what the sediment that's remaining in each of the sieves at the end of um, shaking them and then we plot that up as a cumulative distribution. So the median particle size in this case for this blue line um, is somewhere around 100 um, millimetres. Um, the larger end, so the 75th percentile here is more like uh, 170 uh, millimetres. And so that's by, um, by weight if we'd done a, um, a grid-based sampling strategy, we'd be counting the sediments. So in fact, it would be by number in, in that case, not by weight. And it's possible to convert between the two, or to at least convert from a count-based um, sediment size distribution to a weight-based um, sediment size distribution. Now, the particular feature of these sediment size distributions that we might be interested in, again depends on the particular nature of the study that we're doing. 
if we're interested in the roughness of the bed because it influences flow resistance then it's not the fine sizes that we're interested in because they are deposited within the coarser material it's actually the coarser fraction that's of interest to us in terms of channel roughness and um, the um, the d84 the 84th percentile diameter particle diameter by weight is often used um, as an indicator of the roughness of the channel for flow resistance studies. If we were interested in the permeability of the bed, because it's important for um, exchange of water between the surface water and the, and the boundary sediments, it's not the coarse sediments we care about, it's the fine sediments, because the fine sediments clog up all the, the um, pore spaces between the coarse sediments. So if we have a lot of fine material, it means it has a low permeability. And so it might be the 10th percentile, the D10, that we're interested in. So that's all for particle size measurement and sampling and uh, reporting. Um, and uh, I've provided here some additional resources you might, you might like to refer to.